So, we're ready to go. All right. And we just left uh, before our break on the topic of fillet welds. We've covered PJPs, and now let's compare fillet welds and PJPs because they can both be used in corner and T-joints. So now I need to make a decision of which one I'm going to use. Here on the left, we have a T-joint. On the right, we have a uh, T-joint. On the left, fillet welds. On the right, PJP groove welds. Now, PJP groove welds are more efficient in their use of weld metal. That is, I get more capacity out of a PJP with the same amount of weld than I do out of a fillet weld. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The throat of the fillet weld occurs on that 45 degree plane, whereas the throat of the PJP is least dimension to the root or perpendicular to the, to the uh, face. And trigonometry tells us that's 41% larger. However, um, the common approach would be to not put in the same amount of weld metal, but put in the same throat dimension. And that's what this figure is illustrating, the two welds with the same throat. When you go through the mathematics of this, you find that it takes half as much weld metal to make a PJP of the same strength as a fillet weld. Now, before you write that down and go to the bank with it, we need, need to realize that somebody needs to prepare that bevel associated with the PJP, and that's going to cost money. It didn't come into the shop that way, and we have to add in extra cost in order to save money. Well, here's a rule of thumb that's developed over the years, and it's pretty robust, I think. If you require a throat dimension, not a leg size, but a throat dimension of three-quarter inch or less, you're probably better off to use fillet welds. And if the required weld throat has a throat that's greater than three-quarter inch, then you probably are going to save money by going to PJPs. Now let's make this very, very practical. How often do you specify fillet welds with a leg size um, that's one inch? Almost never. And as a result, almost never do you specify PJPs where you could specify fillet welds. So you're already doing the right thing. Use fillet welds. Where you need, you probably use CJPs or some place you're going to use PJPs because you can't use fillet welds. Uh, but if you have the option and they're small, you're probably going to use fillet welds. So even though the fillet welds are more efficient, excuse me, PJPs are more efficient in their use of weld metal, the fillet welds don't require joint preparation. And so you'll probably use the fillet welds. So there are the welds that we've talked about so far and the throats associated with those welds. The CJP groove weld where the throat is equal to the thickness of the material. The PJP groove weld where the throat depends on the included angle. And if you have a large included angle alpha, S is equal to E. If it's a smaller included angle alpha, S is equal to E plus 1 8 inch. And then for the fillet weld along the 45 degree plane when we have a 90 degree included angle. Plug and slot welds, not commonly used for structural applications. Not particularly good in cyclically loaded applications. One of the more common applications of plug welds is when you have a doubler plate on a deep column section. Uh, so if you have a 24 inch column section, for example, and you have to put in a doubler, uh, in addition to the fillet weld around the perimeter, you may find yourself applying some plug or slot welds uh, to keep that panel from buckling. Uh, there we have the pictorial of the welds that we're talking about. They are uniquely applied to lap joints. Uh, they're, again, not often used for structural applications if you're involved with bridges. Uh, fatigue, uh, the fatigue stress range allowable for plug and slot welds is the bottom of the barrel. And so we don't use that for transferring major loads. It's not a particularly good substitution for misplaced bolt holes. Uh, that may not be the right uh, language to use, but when bolt holes don't line up, it's all too tempting for somebody to say, well, let's weld up that hole instead. In fact, that's led to a whole variety of problems. Or when holes are in the wrong place, some people are very tempted to fill up those holes uh, with weld metal so that there's not a void in, in the member. Um, if that's the case, just putting a bolt in there and tightening it up is a pretty good, pretty good solution. And um, uh, so be careful about inadvertently just filling up holes uh, with weld metal. Now, plug welds can be made. They can be made successfully. But the geometry of plug is typically different than the geometry of a hole that's going to be used for a bolted connection.
The next topic is one I previewed, promised you several times, and that is the situation or issue of the strength of the weld metal. And here we're talking about matching, undermatching, and overmatching weld metal strength. Matching strength means that the minimum specified properties for the filler metal and the minimum specified properties of the steel are about the same. That's how it's used. Overmatching is when you deliberately select weld metal that's higher in strength than the steel you're joining. Undermatching is when you deliberately strength a select weld metal that's lower in strength than the steel you're welding. Now, matching strength weld metal is only required for CJP groove welds loaded in tension. It's okay for all of our welds, and it's what we usually use for groove welds. For lower strength steels, it's typically what we apply. But when you get to higher strength steels, higher than your grade 50s that are the most commonly used, undermatching may become a viable option that you need to consider. Undermatching can be used for fillet welds, it can be used for PJP groove welds, it can also be used for, groove, uh, for CJP groove welds that are not loaded in tension. If they're loaded in shear or parallel loading, that may be an option. Some people have called it optimized weld metal. If you're in the bridge building, you do any work with HPS, high performance grade 70 steel, grade 100 material, they talk about undermatching weld metal and call it optimized. Why? It's more crack resistant. So we can do things with undermatched weld metal that may be very problematic with matching strength, and that's the reason why that's desirable. It's particularly well suited if our fillet weld size, PJP groove weld size, is limited by the minimum size anyhow. So we went through the calculations, we found out we needed to put in a bigger weld than necessary. We'll put in that bigger weld than necessary with undermatched weld metal is a good, efficient use of doing that. Well, this pictorial represents matching strength. The blue is the liquid weld metal that's solidified. It always is in residual tension where we deposit that weld metal. Surrounding the area of residual tension is res area of residual compression. Basic static says we have to have both. And the net capacity of the section is not changed with these residual stresses. These residual stresses are estimated to be at the yield point of the material. Higher strength steel, we have higher residual stresses. Those residual stresses do a lot of things. They drive cracking, they dr drive distortion. They also impair our fatigue performance uh, out of our welded uh, connections. Uh, if I do undermatching, excuse me, if I have matching, the residual stresses are the yield point of lower strength material in the system. If I do undermatching, I'm typically going to put in larger welds because the product of throat times the strength of the material is going to govern the performance of the connection. So I put in a larger weld, but I put in a lower strength material, so the residual stresses in the connection actually go down. They're also distributed over a wider area, and that gives us greater fracture resistance, uh, excuse me, it gives us greater resistance to cracking, and what we're talking about typically here is cracking during the time of fabrication. Overmatching. Overmatching is never required by AWS D1.1 or AISC. It does naturally occur when we weld on high, some lower strength steels with alloy electrodes, but if we deliberately considered overmatching in design, the results can be non-conservative. The reason that's the case is we generally design our groove welds, PJPs, our fillet welds off of the throat dimension, and we use 30% of the electrode classification number. What we typically do not do is make a check on this fusion zone of the weld to the base material. And we might want to limit that to about 40% of the yield strength. If we use overmatching weld metal, does everyone see that the weld could become much smaller, but so does the fusion zone? And the weakest link in the system could become the fusion zone instead of the weld metal, but that's not a check we typically make. So that's why we could get non-conservative results if you do that. Uh, you can go through the numbers, you have them there, the conclusion is don't overmatch. Table J2.5 gives us the values that we need for the weld metal strength. I've blown this up in the right hand column, it gives us the required strength of the filler metal for different weld details. Go through this quickly, there's the CJP groove weld intention, which is the first item that was listed in our chart. 
tension effective to the uh, net area in the complete joint penetration groove weld, and there we need to use matching weld metal strength. The next example given is compression normal to the effective area, and there's compression effective uh, normal to the effective area, and there we can use weld metal with the strength equal to or less than matching. And then we have tension or compression parallel to the axis of the weld. There would be tension parallel to the axis of the weld. There's compression parallel to the axis of the weld. And under those conditions, equal to or less than matching may be used. If we have a box section and we put groove welds in the corner or fillet welds in the corner, uh, those welds are loaded in shear. Even if it's a complete joint penetration groove weld, we load it in shear, we can use weld metal with a strength equal to or less than matching. I'm not going to get into some notes here. They're important. It spells out where some CBN toughness is required. Let's continue with PJPs. If you look at the PJPs, regardless of the loading, it says equal to or less than matching may be used. When I go to fillet welds, regardless of the loading, it says equal to or le less than matching may be used. Finally, for plug welds, regardless of loading, equal to or less than matching may be used. So if we look we, in our table, we had one situation where we were required to have matching strength, and in all other situations, we were allowed to have some degree of undermatching. And this is important because as you go to higher strength steels, you can see that we have a whole array of situations where undermatching may be used. Same thing shows up in AWS, different table, a little different format, but the same net results. So now let's wrap up this section, and I want to give you kind of a handy uh, guide as to how to select the right weld type for the different joints. You start with the joint, that's what you've designed, and then we're going to join it. What kind of weld do we need? Well, if we start with a butt joint, if we have a high degree of tension across that connection, we're going to need a CJP. If it's lesser amount of tension, uh, we could uh, use a PJP. If it's loaded in shear, no doubt a PJP will be adequate. If it's loaded in compression, we can have PJP. You may want to even consider bearing across that butt joint. If you have a corner joint, chances are it's not loaded in tension across that connection although that may be the case for some box columns where you have a moment connection made into that box column. If it's a big tension, you're going to need a CJP. Likely, you'll have less than that. You can use a PJP or a fillet weld on the inside if you can get inside the box. If it's loaded in shear, which is a very common application, then likely a PJP will do the job or a PJP with a fillet weld on the inside. Finally, if you have compression across here, again, not a typical loading condition, but a PJP uh, would likely be uh, acceptable. Someone asked about lamellar tearing, not exclusively associated with corner joints, but it could be. Here's a corner joint CJP. Steel is not fully isotropic uh, in the direction of rolling and particularly in perpendicular to that direction. Uh, there can be inclusions in the steel when you drill a hole in here and bolt it up. It's not of significance when you put in a weld and that weld shrinks. It induces through thickness strains, and those strains can cause those inclusions to pop together, and that's what we call lamellar tearing. Lamellar tearing is a steel issue and a welding issue. This started when someone specified a CJP groove weld for this joint that they really didn't need a CJP groove weld in. Because if I can go to a PJP, you can see that the driving force, the amount of welding that's required, can be greatly reduced. Moreover, if I bevel the potentially offending member, now I can seal up those inclusions and have less likelihood of lamellar tearing. Lamellar tearing was a big deal in the 60s and the 70s. Steel production has gotten better. It's not nearly the concern that we used to have. I don't mean to ignore it, but uh, it's certainly not the um, concern we had several years ago. If you need more capacity, putting a fillet weld on the inside, getting away from straining right out here on the edge can be helpful in those situations as well. As we talk about corner joints, I think of box sections. As we think of box sections, one of the issues is can you get people inside to do the welding on the inside? Can you get equipment in there? Can you do it in a safe manner?
in most cases when you're inside a box like this this will constitute a confined space as ash as osha has to find that and there are special precautions that need to be taken when welding in confined spaces t joints if i have tension across that t joint uh, i can develop that uh, resistance with a fillet weld uh, then i use my three quarter inch rule of thumb to decide whether I use a fillet weld or a PJP. If it's loaded in shear, still fillet weld or uh, uh, PJP. If it's in compression, fillet weld or PJP. Lap joints, I can only use fillet welds or a combination of fillet welds and plug welds in those kinds of situations, no matter what loading is applied. Let's talk a little bit more about lap joints. We have in AISC, a provision that requires the minimum overlap of a lap joint be at least 5T, where T is the thickness of the thinner material and not less than one inch. The reason for that is to avoid the localized kinking that may occur that puts high strain at the weld root and at the weld toes. We also have a requirement for the uh, longitudinal spacing of fillet welds, and we want to make certain that the uh, length of the weld is at least as great as the distance between those welds. It's very possible that you could have a relatively small load and you could develop that uh, resistance to that with a short fillet weld. However, this load is distributed all the way across the width of the part. There's a shear lag issue and there's also a local bending issue that would cause prying about the root of the weld. So this provision about proportionality between the longitudinal weld and the transverse spacing has been de uh, developed. This is a double-sided lap joint where we're welding on either side, but please note that sometimes we can't get the weld to the opposite side. And so if we can't apply the weld at that location, then we need to do something to prevent straining about the root, because when that's loaded, it's going to strain the root and tend to tear that root. We have a requirement in AISC that says you uh, develop that resistance with plug welds or slot welds or a mechanical support internal to the structure to preclude straining about that route. And here's how the commentary describes what I just went through as well. Well, we're through our second portion of the lecture. Uh, and this has been the fundamentals of the connection design. And now we want to go into, and we will go through this very quickly, uh, calculating weld size. You have all these slides. You can study these on your own. And since it gets into some math and some examples, these are things that are probably best done in your office anyhow. We're going to look at a couple of approaches, how we handle fillet weld sizes and how we handle groups of welds that are subject to bending. First, the condition, the simple condition of fillet welds that are subject to direct loading. Uh, direct loading would be like this bracket underneath this uh, rolled section, and we have a fillet weld of a given length, we have a given force, and we need to size that weld. Ultimately, we assume our welds fail in shear, no matter how the welds are loaded. In this example, we obviously have a tensile loading condition, but that tensile loading ultimately causes shear along the throat of the weld. Those shear planes are assumed for most of our calculations to be 60 degrees. That's not always the case. Uh, that's why we have increased capacity, the 50% increase depending on loading direction. For right now, I'm going to make this simple and just look at shear along a 45 degree plane. Uh, here we have a similar kind of beam, a similar kind of bracket, but notice that the weld is loaded directly in shear, and ultimately it's shear along the throat of the weld that's going to cause failure. So we know that we have this shear plane uh, to get from the leg to that shear plane, of course, is some simple geometry for a 90 degree joint is a cosine of 45 degrees. And that's what gives us this 70% factor that we've already, maybe we haven't referenced, uh, but that's where that comes from. So shear is force over area. Area is the thickness times the length. We can put our throat times the length. We calculate for the throat to get to the leg and we can get an equation that takes on this form. In the United States, we use 30% of the design allowable, uh, excuse me, 30% of the electric classification for our design allowable. Uh, so out of a typically 70,000 tensile strength weld material, 
we now use 21 KSI. When we have 60, it would be 18, 80 would be 24. Now in Australia, they use one-third instead of 30 uh, percent. And of course, there's good reason. They're in the southern hemisphere. The effects of gravity are a little bit less. And they, their standards had developed around one third. We used 30 percent. This is based upon the Higgins and Priest uh, studies of 1969 era. Uh, and that's how that came about. For those of you who are using Mr. Blodgett's blue design a weldment book, that was written in 1966. The design allowable to 30% was changed in 1969. Guess what all his examples used? The old design allowables. You'll get conservative results, but you'll put in wells larger than necessary if you use those figures. So remember that when you're using that, that book. Where do we get that 30%? Well, if you look at tables like this, and specifically the AWS version of the table, there's the 30% of the nominal tensile strength of the filler material. If we take that 30% and multiply it by the 0 0.707, we get a familiar term 0 0.212, uh, and we can use that for uh, calculating uh, the various weld sizes that we need. Uh, you can rearrange the equation, ultimately calculate the allowable force through a connection made with a certain electrode size, length, and weld uh, throat size. Uh, if you have a force per unit length, you can divide the whole thing out by length and calculate force per unit length and the amount of weld required per unit length. These charts were in all the drafting rooms years ago. Today, we probably put it in a spreadsheet. I want to give it to you this way for one reason only. A quarter inch fillet weld made of E70 weld metal is good for 3,710 pounds per linear inch. There's a lot of capacity in these fillet welds. You see, in a quarter inch fillet weld, one inch long, loaded along its throat, that's what it's good for. You say, well, I think I could take a, a piece of steel, put a quarter inch fillet weld, and pry it against the root and, and break it at less than 3,000 pounds. Yes, because you're straining the root and tearing it. This is the capacity when loaded in shear along its throat. Simple design example. I won't go through the numbers. You can do that on your own. Uh, where we're calculating the weld size, it comes out and says use 3 16 But we also notice the thickness of the materials. So we go back to our pre-qualified minimum size table. And we find out that the weld needs to be made larger because of the thickness of the materials involved. This is where I get to the notes that I was going to tell you about. Remember, we looked at that chart before, and I said we're going to talk about some notes. Well, here's the notes. There's a note for a single asterisk. It says, for non-low hydrogen processes, the thickness is the thickness of the thicker part. For, let's continue on to the double asterisk. Oops, I guess I have to do it here. Here we go. For low hydrogen processes, tease the thickness of the thinner part joint. So when you use this table and you have unequal thicknesses, the minimum fillet weld size, if you're using non-low hydrogen, is the thickness of the thicker part. And if you're using low hydrogen, it's the thickness of the thinner part. You say, well, the steel doesn't care whether it's low hydrogen or, or not low hydrogen when it's transferring load. Absolutely. This is a fabrication issue. It's a cracking issue. And the steel does care whether it's low hydrogen or not while you're fabricating it. That's why this chart has nothing to do with design loads. It has to do with practical fabrication issues. There's been more than a few questions on this. If you look at steel interchange, the latest issue of modern steel construction, there was a question on this. Why does AISC not have this table in here that says the thickness is based upon the thinner, uh, thicker part when it's non-low hydrogen? 992 is assumed to be the steel you're going to use today. 992 is group 2 in AWS. AWS is group 2 steel, so you use low hydrogen. 992, low hydrogen. If you use low hydrogen, the thickness is the thinner, uh, is the thicker of the the thickness is the thinner of the parts joint. Okay? So that's why the table now says it's based upon the thickness of the thinner part. 
And then the triple asterisk says, and if it's a cyclically loaded structure, if it's bridge, then the minimum size isn't to the one eighth of an inch. It's, a, it's going to be a minimum of three sixteenths. Let's look at indirectly loaded fillet welds. And these are fillet welds that are typically loaded on in bending members. Uh, you used to know because you studied this in, in the university what the uh, longitudinal shear was uh, between the web and a flange of a built up shape. And you had equations like that. And I've given you those equations. And you can look them up again. We have an actual plate girder example that you can go through. And when you go through, you can calculate the required weld size using those equations. And when you calculate it, you come back to 3 sixteenths. But we go back to our minimum size table. And it says you need a quarter. The last thing we want to preview to you is weld groups. This often is the case where uh, we have an array of welds that are all loaded at the same time. Blodgett presents a method where the weld is treated as a line. And by going through that, we can take standard design equations and we can manipulate those equations and consider the weld profile as a line and then calculate the required weld size. So for those of you who don't have the Blodgett book, you want to get that and go through that methodology. And I've got the steps here. You can read those and study those on your own. This chart comes out of Blodgett. And you, of course, have to get a copy of that. Uh, AISC has a methodology uh, where we use an instantaneous center. And the design manual has incorporated examples uh, of how to handle that, including taking advantage of the 50% increase in capacity of the transversely loaded fillet welds. In your manuals, you have an example that's been worked out. And again, you can do that, follow that on your own uh, to find those examples. Before we leave this section of weld size, we want to talk about weld properties for just a moment. You know that the capacity of the weld depends on the geometry of the weld, that is, the throat and the length. It also depends on the strength of the deposited weld metal. Now, oftentimes, people say, how do you get that E70 number anyhow? Well, we take a large groove weld, we fill it with weld metal, and we machine out of that weld metal an all weld metal tensile bar. Those are typically called 505 bars because the old dimension used to be 0.505 inches in diameter. And that was carefully selected because back in slide rule days, 0.505 translated into 0.2 square inches. And so that was an easy calculation to make. And then we load that up in a tensile testing machine. And uh, with that, we can uh, eventually get to the point of yielding, elongation. And out of that specimen, we get yield strength, we get tensile strength, and we get percent elongation. That's a multiple pass weld made in a groove weld configuration, 100% weld metal, basically no influence of the base metal uh, on the strength of the, the, the uh, deposit. And of course, we can get a stress strain curve from that um, with the yield and tensile uh, from that. Another test that's important, and some of you know very much about this, and some of you may not, so we cover it, is the Sharpie impact uh, specimen. This is a tool to measure the resistance of a material to fracture. Uh, high toughness is good. Uh, we have a bar that's nominally 3 8 by 3 8 by 2 and a half inches long. It has a very carefully uh, applied notch that's put into the bar. Uh, 